to all. My name is Miguel Nakamura, and I'm honored to be here this morning only because of two, at least two notable absences who are not able to come. One is uh, Victor Rivero, our Director General at CIMAT. He, I, I bear his message of welcome to Mexico and welcome to CIMAT. We are the little red house up on the hill. CIMAT has three academic departments, probability and statistics, computer science, and mathematics, all of which are relevant to environmetrics. The second person who couldn't be here is uh, the chair of the probability and statistics department, Jose Alfredo Lopez Mimbela. I happen to be the chair of our graduate studies in that department. We have a master's and a PhD program in statistics. On behalf of all of us, thank you to the sponsors and thank you to all the members of the committees, Leticia, and uh, our best wishes for a very successful and productive meeting. Welcome. Thank you. So, good morning to everybody. It is my pleasure to open the 29th uh, uh, conference of the International Environmental Society. And uh, thank you for coming. And uh, thank you for vitalizing the conference with your scientific uh, and uh, social contribution. Uh, this year it's uh, important for ties because uh, a little bit a uh, turning point between the uh, yearly uh, uh, conference system. So this is the last uh, yearly conference, annual conference, and it's the first uh, biannual conference. So the, the next uh, conference will, will be in the 2020, but in the 2019, we will have uh, some regional conferences. So we have this odd and years system now. Uh, so, um, Many of you know very well Environmental Society. Some of you are new, maybe. And uh, uh, if you are interested in the history of the Environmental Society, there is a recently published paper by Sylvia Esterby that I think is here, uh, OK, uh, on Environmetrics Journal, which uh, review 25 years of uh, uh, scientific history. Thank you, Sylvia, for writing this interesting <laughs> paper about our history. Uh, the scientific program, program is very interesting, and I wish to thank uh, Julia, the chair of the scientific committee, for setting up such a uh, high-level scientific contribution and uh, inviting many of you to come here. Uh, a great appreciation for uh, Leticia Ramirez and all the local committee for the warm hospitality here and uh, the beautiful venue. And also, of course, uh, thanks to CIMAT because uh, it's a beautiful place and very nice to be here with you. Um, so um, just a, a kind of communication Last but not least, uh, uh, recently the board decided to uh, reinstate the Abdel Sharawi Young Research Award. So this year we have uh, 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 um, to uh, deliver the award, and this will happen uh, during the um, plenary session on Tuesday, uh, which is the um, Wiley Best Paper session and uh, Abdel Sharawi Young Research Award session. So this will happen tomorrow morning. So thank you to everybody. Okay, so I'll be brief because most of the stuff has already been said. So I'd like to, first of all, welcome everybody. Um, it's great uh, to see many old friends and it's exciting to meet new friends uh, coming to Taiz. Uh, Thais is um, a thriving community, and this uh, Thais meeting, we try to make 
uh, very interdisciplinary. So at least we tried our best to make it interdisciplinary and make more connections across different domains. Environmental sciences, CS, data science, and so on. Um, I would like to thank uh, program committee members who were uh, whose help is uh, very hard to overestimate and be in all those sessions. And um, I hope that you would enjoy the conference. Thank you. Well, just a few announcements. What? Well, only one. Uh, we have already printed the program. We have a slight change in this uh, for the session today. And you can find this uh, change. It's only one one talk that was moved. You can you can see it online. But after this change, we have to uh, we'll have a, a printed sheet of all the changes that can happen because actually right now we are in vacations at CIMAT. That's why it's very very empty. We have it CIMAT almost for for our enjoyment. But the thing is that we cannot up, uh, update the web page right now. So any communication that we want to to make to you, we, it will be by email mainly. Yeah? Welcome, everybody. It's, it's, and we're very happy to have you here. So this is my second pleasure today, uh, after the opening, to invite uh, uh, Doug to give uh, uh, the presidential address to this conference. Uh, Doug is well known to environmental statisticians for the uh, huge production about spatial statistics and not only. Um, in general, maybe it's good to introduce a little bit him, uh, Douglas William Nitschka, uh, is a senior scientist uh, at NCAR, the National uh, Center of Atmospheric Research. He has been uh, uh, director of the Institute of uh, Mathematics Applied to Geosciences until last year when the institute was closed. And he served there for many years, I think since 1997 or so. And now it's a changing point for him and is moving from NCAR to uh, Colorado School of Mines in the next fall. So I wish to congratulate for the new position and the new opportunities. Uh, I mean, as mentioned, it's well known. He got his PhD in statistics in, in Wisconsin, Madison, after a summa cum laude in Duke University, and uh, has been editor of special statistics. And he has been awarded by the fellowship of the Institute of Mathematical Statistics. His research is about uh, non-parametrics regression and spatial statistics. Uh, and uh, his talk that is going to give is about uh, uh, non-stationary spatial data. So uh, um, we will see uh, interesting things about the flexible modeling of large data sets. Yesterday we had a course on uh, deep mining and issues related to big data and environmental uh, problems, uh, which was uh, by Nathaniel uh, uh, Newlands. Thank you for, for giving this interesting course. And uh, now we go on with uh, uh, state-of-the-art problems for environmetrics. Thank you, Dan. So let me um, let, let, let me first thank thank Ties for in, inviting me, and especially for Alessandro for for giving the presidential address. I um, I, I want to emphasize that there are many of you in the audience um, that that could give a presidential address and um, in some sense I feel a little bit flattered and also embarrassed that I'm I'm, I'm talking to you about things um, I I have the uh, I guess the advantage and, and, and the disadvantage that probably every part of this talk um, s someone in the audience knows more about this than, than I do. so you know that's 
Um, so part part of the time here is I'm going to try to finish in a very uh, in 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 a fair, fairly short sh short span, and then we'll have more time for questions and and comments. All right. Um, so when I was um, starting my 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 thesis work, um, it was a it was a time where um, statisticians were, were making the transition from just looking at kernel estimates, which were sort of locally weighted averages of data, to more sophisticated methods. In, the, in that case, splines and eventually Bayesian methods and geostatistics came in. Um, that's, uh, I feel like this talk is a little bit going, going back to that, because really what I'm going to argue is we need to start thinking about doing local fits sort of based on sort of simple ideas like kernels, local windows. Um, but we do have this perspective to think about global models that these things fit into, which is very different than initially the way kernels um, took off. All right. And, okay. So, uh, where, where do I point this? Oh, okay, great, great. All right, so um, five parts to this. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about data, non-stationary Gaussian fields, um, two, two, two examples of ap applications of, of that kind of met methodology, and then finally I'm going to talk about um, doing data, data analysis on the NCAR su supercomputers. Um, like a lot of my talks, I want to say that probably one of the biggest takeaways is if I can introduce you to these two data sets, and they're, they're a great fertile ground for testing out other stuff. Um, and uh, the, the other thing that I, I want to em emphasize up front is um, in, in giving this address, I decided just to talk about lots of stuff that I was interested in. And um, I've, I've borrowed quite, quite a bit, especially quite a bit from um, Mikhail and, and Michael's paper on Argo, Argo modeling. And um, Mikhail is here, and I hope in the questions and answers he'll, he'll also come in and, and um, talk about this. Um, on, the, uh, uh, on the other side, on the um, climate modeling side, I want to sort of highlight Ashton and Mitchell and, and Dorrit, um, who, um, who helped me with the uh, with with modeling that that climate data, all right. So, um, <clears throat> the uh, the the first part of this talk is is just going to go through these the these data sets, and um, okay. And I think that um, you know I've I've been at many conferences, and uh, occasionally a speaker will start and say. That's the wrong talk. That's my older talk, and I and I've always wondered, what what are these goofballs that they that they that they can't get their their talk straight? And um, now I understand how easy that is to do. <laughs> All right. So um, what what I want to talk to talk about first is the uh, <clears throat> and that that wasn't a planned joke, but I guess it's a joke. Um, it's uh, I I want to talk to talk about the, this climate climate model data set, and then we'll talk about the, the Argo floats. Okay, so um, <clears throat> the uh, climate models are large nu numerical codes. They're expensive to run. Um, they have the, the, the property that you can create, actually, um, replicates of your, of your model runs to get an idea of what the variability is of, of the response. And th this particular data set is fairly unique in that there's um, 30, now, now 40 members of this run. So we can think of these as um, uh, doing a climate model run for the future, trying to figure out what the climate is. There is variability among these 30 different members, and that variability can be interpreted simply as the uncertainty in the Earth system's response um, over over time, so these are chaotic systems. There's some um, var variability in in what we predict. So the the um, the variability among these members is um, quite important. Um, it's a fairly large spatial data set as as these things go. Um, 
about uh, 55,000 lo locations um, uh, along sim simulation period. And I, I, I put this up here ju just to remind me to say that this is based on a particular future scenario. And um, part, part, part of the challenge is to understand how these models respond un under different scenarios of human activities in the future. Um, this 8.5 is a situation where um, green, gr greenhouse gases are in, in increasing pretty much business as, as usual, that there's not um, uh, a lot of reductions in them. OK. Um, this is what the, 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 the particular model response is. So these, these climate models produce lots of data, lots of fields, um, often three-dimensional fields. Um, it's important for you to realize that I'm going to be talking about a, a very small slice of this. And um, it's, it's a little bit of a confusing slice, too, in that it's been um, pre-processed beyond just the original fields. So um, what we have here is, is not a temperature field from, from the models. It's actually showing us the response of local temperatures to a change in, in global temperature. So we, um, we, we run these models, um, these 30 member ensembles. We take the mean. The interpretation here is that these, these red pixels are colored about at um, 2.5 degrees. Um, this, this means that a, a global change of one degree will result in a 2.5 degree change in this local area. Now, what's, what's really nice about this kind of summary is someone with an impacts model, with, with a crop model, doesn't need to run an entire climate system model to determine local effects. If they have an idea of how global temperatures will change, they can then use this kind of um, use this kind of surface to, um, to infer what will happen locally here. And, and what, what you can see is no surprise. Um, over, over the land, we see larger increases due to changes in global temperature. Over the ocean, less so. OK. So um, this is the spatial data problem. And um, part of the reason I like this problem is that it involves replicates of the spatial field. Since these are from climate model ensembles, we know that these really are independent replicates of the field. Um, there are also um, fields that people actually care about. So it's always good to look at data where people are interested in the, in the analysis. And um, not only that, there's a lot of non-stationary structure, and it just jumps out at you. And I'll, later in the talk, I'll show you some pictures of this, and um, it, it really is apparent. So, what we have here is, th this is the, the mean response, um, the, these responses to um, changes in global temperature. What I did was I subtracted off the mean from each of the separate model runs. And here, here is the variability in these fields across, across the first eight. And of course, there's 22 more of these. Um, the, the goal, very simply, is that we would like to create a spatial model that represents the, the distribution of, of the variation among these. Notice that there's spatial coherence here, so we have to use spatial statistics to, to, to do it. Um, we, we'd like to have a model where we can very efficiently simulate from this distribution. So um, for an impacts person, instead of being um, restricted to the 30 climate model runs, we could actually simulate, say, 1,000, 5,000 replicates of this so they could sort of explore more e extremes in, in the fields. Okay, so that's, that's the one goal. Okay, so um, th this is where I'm borrowing um, a lot of the project from Mick, Mikael and, and, and Michael. Um, this is a, a very different kind of um, cl climate example. So there's this um, amazing network of, of ocean drifting floats that um, they basically spend, spend time just, just following um, currents in the ocean. Um, for most of their time, they, they, they drift at about, is it 2,000 meters? 1,000 a, a, a thousand, a meters in the ocean. About every 10 days, they rise to the surface. As they rise, they create, um, collect a profile of observations of the ocean. And then when they, when they get to the surface, they actually transmit that, that in, in information to a satellite. And then the 
boxes collected in a common re repository. Um, so there, there's about 4,000 of the, these floats currently. Um, as I said, they, they take observations about every 10 days. Um, highly irregular. If you wanted an example of a large spatial data set that is not on a grid, um, that is geophysical, this is, this is it. Um, so Michael, Michael and, and, and Mikael have, have worked on this data. Um, the, the, the goal here is, is quite simple. We'd like to take this irregular data and create monthly fields over, um, over the different time periods and also over space. And um, with those estimates, attach uncertainty to them. So the usual kind of spatial problem. All right. And I'm trying to... Okay, so a little bit about non-stationary Gaussian processes. Um, the, main, the main object here is I, I'm going to assume that the, the mean has been taken out of this stochastic um, process, F of S. S. S would be locations here, either longitude and latitude or longitude, latitude and, and depth. Um, we have a, a, a covariance function um, for, for these. And um, at least initially, I want to focus on a stationary one. And so um, the, 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 this is a recipe to get um, the covariance between two, two locations. Um, so we have a variance out front. And then this exponential function, I miss the minus sign here, um, controls the uh, Cor correlation as a function of the distance of, of separation. Um, this is a, a, a completely isotropic example, and what it says is that the correlation between two points in the field um, only depends on their distance of, of, of separation. And um, th this is a very strong assumption. In, in, in the case of, of both of these um, examples of data, it, it, it really doesn't hold. Um, if, if you think about trying to correlate um, those fields um, where one point is in the ocean, one point is over, over, over the land. We expect a different relationship than if both of those are over the ocean or both o over the land. Okay. Um, uh, be besides that exponential function, a, a common, a common um, for form that's used is, is the matern. And I'm, I'm just going to sort of write it out as matern so you can s see it in the formulas. Um, but its uh, its, its its actual form is as as a Bessel function. Um, there's a smoothness uh, uh, associated with this, and um, a, a smoothness of, of 0.5 is a is a nice reference point because we end up getting the exponential back. Um, but there's a there's a whole range of of smoothnesses um, that that we can choose here. In the um, in, in the first example, looking at the climate model output, I'm just using a, a, a smoothness of one. Okay, so um, th this is getting into the um, into the, the non-stationary as aspects of this, and um, this slide may look a little bit different than the others. I was sort of just marching through the usual kind of geostatistics um, co co covariance functions. Um, the way I like to think about non-stationary fields is um, rather than talking about the covariance, I like to represent the process. And so th this is a, a recipe to tell you how to get this correlated field over space. And what you do is you take an integral. Um, you have this kernel, which we're going to assume that we know. And we're going to integrate this against white noise. Um, if, if this makes you nervous because it's bringing back memories of sigma algebras and um, measure theory, um, what, what you can think about is just, just take a really fine grid over, over space, um, generate independent normal zero ones, and just sum this up. Take, take the kernel, take a discrete sum, and you're, and you're done. Um, but in, in any case, um, th this is a process. And what I want to emphasize here is we can make up all kinds of stories about age. Um, and, as, and as long as they're not too crazy, we will get a process that we can simulate and, and describe. That's very different than starting with a covariance and trying to make modifications of it 
and hope that it still stays as a valid covariance function, i.e. that it's, that it's po positive definite. And I want to say that one, one of the early um, gr groups that, that really sort of, um, sort of r realized this and, and has championed it is, is um, Harvard's group and, and sort of connected with, with INLA. Um, so it's a, uh, it's a, it's a very, very nice idea. And with this particular representation, we can just write down, at least in, in some kind of formula, what the implied covariance function is. So there, there it is there. If we come up with a particular H, we always know what the covariance function is. All right. Okay. So here's... Um, Here's an example of that. So I'm, uh, I'm going back to the, to, to the exponential. Um, looks like I got my minus signs in now. So um, this theta is a, is a scale parameter. It, it controls how the correlation between two points dies off over, over space. Um, the, uh, the, the sigma of s here is just the changing variance of the process. And it turns out that um, that's pretty easy to handle when you're, when, when you're doing, doing statistics of this kind. Um, the theta of s is, is much more difficult. OK, so here's, here's my kernel. Um, that, that implies a certain process that we can simulate and talk about. Here is the uh, covariance function for it. And um, I, I guess what I want to emphasize here is that notice that these two locations were getting um, functions that, that depend on, on those two locations. And then we have an integral um, that also depends on, on those two locations. So it's a, it's a pretty complicated object here. Um, the interesting thing about this is that even though we're choosing an exponential for a kernel, if we uh, create this model in two dimensions, we actually get a, something close to um, a turn with a smoothness of, of 1.0. So there's a there's a little bit of a difference between these averaging kernels that we choose and the resulting smoothness of the process. And if you're comfortable thinking about integrals and convolutions and Green's functions, this, this all sort of is, makes sense. Um, so th this result holds when our scale parameter is just constant. And so that would be just assuming we have a stationary um, correlation function. If theta is unequal, which is the interesting case here, and I should say the most appropriate for these data examples, um, it's difficult to get a closed form expression for this, even though um, we may think this is a good idea. So um, part, part of what this talk is about is to how to finesse the fact that we can't really do, do this integral. And um, you'll, you'll see how I'm going to be che cheating with that. Okay. So um, what I'm going to go on here, I'm going to wrap up this, this non-stationary part by showing you um, some, uh, well, let's see, wait, wait a second here. Sorry, this is a little bit um, touchy in terms of advancing things here. OK. So. Um, The main tool that I have here is, is simply um, windowing the data over space, or in the Argo float data, windowing the data over space and, and time, and fitting a stationary model to that. And that, that's going to turn out to be very useful and very computationally of, efficient. In order to, um, to give a little bit more detail about that operation, I wanted to write down the likelihood just to remind you what the calculation is. Um, and, and also just in, introduce the, this notation for the, um, for the covariance matrix up here. OK, so um, we're going to start with the usual kind of observational model, where um, we have observations at these locations, um, S sub i. Um, there's our smooth facial, spatial field. We have a little bit of measurement error or nugget um, white noise added to that. These are our observations. Um, we're assuming that F follows a multivariate normal. And this, this K here is a covariance matrix that's formed from the covariance function. 
Okay, so um, very, very standard. Um, we have our, our likelihood here, which would be at the core of, the, of a Bayesian analysis as well. I'm writing out explicitly the parameters here just so that you know what the, what the heck that I'm, I'm trying to fit. Um, the, the sigma squared and the, and the scale are going to be in this covariance function um, K. And then here's, here, here's my nugget variance. And um, so K appears in two places. It appears in this quadratic form and also in, in, in this determinant. Um, so if we, if we have data Y and if we have data over a, a small window, we can um, estimate these parameters by, by maximum likelihood and that's, that, that's what I'm doing. I want to point out that if we use the entire data set in either of these cases, this K would have dimensions, this matrix would have dimensions on the order of the number of locations. And um, in, in, its, in, in its exact form, it would really not be computable. Um, occasionally, I'll give a talk where some um, linear, linear algebra um, sort of macho guy comes in and says, oh, I can, I can factor you know, a matrix that's 50,000 by, by 50,000. And, and so then you know, I, I say, well, I can always find a bigger data set than that. Um, the, the other thing is that I often can, can spin that to say, well, yeah, you, you can do it, but it's going to take five hours. Um, you know, really, th this is about looking at data and getting results back quickly. You know, I, I'd like the results back in five minutes rather than, rather than waiting for things. So there's, um, so it, there, there's o always ways of, of get, getting around those um, linear algebra guys. Um, and I'm trying to, okay, okay, so, gosh, this is, um, I think this, okay, okay. Um, last part, so la last part of this, th this non-stationarity and, um, and sort of doing, do, doing the computations. And um, really, at this point, I'm setting up the, 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 the structure of the talk. Um, I want to tell you about how to simulate a Gaussian process, that would be from the first data example, and how to simulate a conditional Gaussian process, and that would be for the second, date, for the second example for the Argo floats. Um, they have very, sort of very similar structure. They both involve a, a square root of a, of a matrix. Um, so uh, again, we'll, we'll go back to this co covariance matrix that we form from the covariance function. And, um, if we find the square root of, of this covariance function, multiply it by IID normals, that is a, a realization of the Gaussian field um, at these, at these lo locations. Now, now, let me remind you that the reason we want to do this in the first case is we have 30 model runs, and we would like to simulate fields that look like the model runs but are, are cheap. And so assuming that this is a cheap con computation here compared to running a climate model, we can actually do that. Conditional simulation is a little bit more complicated. Here we have data at particular locations. So these would be the Argo float measurements. We would like to simulate the field at a, a fine grid. Um, in this case, um, Mikael and, and Michael use a, a one degree grid. And so we have um, several other, uh, so we have several different covariance matrices here. The um, covariance matrix of the, uh, of just the observations, covariance matrix of the grid, the cross covariance matrix between the grid and the observations. Um, and, and I should say, th these are all pretty big, ma these are all big matrices for large data. Um, the way we do the simulation though, at the heart of this, there is a square root of a matrix. In this case, it's the conditional covariance matrix, um, but we, we find that square root, multiply it by IID norm, normal zero ones. Um, we add our conditional mean to that, and that is a realization of the field that is, that is conditional on the observed data, um, but is, is, is a representation of the um, stochastic process off, off of the data. And so this is a, a very, very useful thing to do. And for large data sets, it's, um, it's a very efficient way to represent the uncertainty 
and there's um, sort of two, two, two reasons for that. One, one reason is that the analytic com computation just to find prediction standard errors is, um, is quite costly. The other is that um, there's sort of this emerging um, education among the geophysics community that these ensembles are, are nice ways to view the entire variability in the field. Um, and you can actually do um, calculations on the ensembles and the result of the calculation will give you valid uncertainty for those derived quantities. For example, if you're taking the, these ocean estimates of temperature and deriving ocean heat content, if you do that for the different conditional samples, um, your distribution of heat content that you derive from each of those fields would be a valid representation. Um, for, for Bayesians, all I'm really talking about saying is that if you sample from the posterior, you can then transform those posterior samples to other things you're interested in, and those are also valid samples from the posterior of, of those transform quantities. So, anyway. Okay, well, wh while I've, uh, I've been talking about that, you, you've been looking at the parameter estimates here. So um, as, I, as I said, this is a little bit ba back to the future where um, we're, we're going through kernel, kernel estimates. Um, I'm just taking uh, 11 by 11 pixel windows um, a, a, across the, uh, the climate model on ensembles, um, fitting, fitting the, the matern to that with a smoothness of one. Here's an estimate of, of the range parameter in, in degrees. The, um, the marginal um, variance of the process, and then, and then the, the, this is the nugget. And I, sh I should mention that, that the nugget is quite, quite small in this problem. Um, so I actually have about 13,000 of these estimates because I'm just moving this window along um, sort of in, in a raster kind of fashion on, at all, all these locations. So there, there they are. Um, so, so uh, I, uh, at least initially, I did this and I said, okay, so now, now, now what, what do I do with this? Um, if, we, if we actually want to follow through this route of being able to use these estimates now, which are really a field, because um, we have each of these parameters at all the different grid, grid boxes, um, we would like to simulate a, a non-stationary field based on those. Um, if we form the the, we're able to form a covariance matrix for these. Um, we simply find the square root and, and do this operation. And of course, the, the problem here is that this is too big to do. Um, the auxiliary problem is that if I actually wanted to use these local estimates and assemble that convolution kernel um, correctly, um, those integrals would also be very, very costly. And I'd have to do on the order of um, 13,000 squared integrals to just fill the covariance matrix. And then, and then, of course, there's the problem that even if I have that, that covariance matrix, it's um, hard, hard to work with. Okay, so the, the solution in, in this case, and, and I should mention, this is also something that the INLA folks know, know how to do, is we take these nice interpretable covariance local estimates based on the matern, and I encode them into a spatial autoregressive model. The spatial autoregressive models are very efficient to compute, and in fact, I can, I can then do this kind of, um, do this kind of sim, sim, simulation. Um, <clears throat> so, um, and in this case, um, as I said, you're looking at, at a slightly, um, uh, um, draft version of the talk, and, and we can see that um, this, uh, this is not quite true. We're actually working with the precision matrix of, of the covariance now, and um, we're actually working with a sparse Cholesky decomposition of, of the precision matrix. Um, but <clears throat> Sorry. Um, but the, the, uh, the, the main idea here is that we're doing this translation from one kind of spatial model into an, an, another kind. Um, ra rather than use the in, INLA model directly, I, I'm using uh, something that, that we call the Lattice-Krieg model, which is, 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 is very similar. 
it has certain advantages and also um, certain disadvantages to the uh, Inlef formulation. Okay, so I'm going to skip some of the details about the SAR model and and just just show you the results here. So um, when we take these local fits, encode them in a slightly different um, and approximating spatial model, we can actually generate fields. Um, here, here's an example of just trying to see how, how well they do. These are the first four model results. Um, and, and these are just the, the first um, just four, four realizations that, that I generated using this um, lattice Krieg form formulation. <clears throat> okay, gosh, this is really, um, there, for those of you that come up here, you'll see this, this is pretty awkward to, to use here. Um, okay, um, I want to say that these, these simulations take on the order of about half a minute on, on my laptop. Um, obviously, these, these model simulations, um, each of these would, would take um, probably on the order of weeks of supercomputer time. So quite a bit of difference. Okay. All right. So, so what I want to do now is um, switch to the open, to, to, to the ocean ocean temperatures, and um, gosh, come on. Okay, so in, in, in parallel to what we did before, um, we're, we're, we're fitting local windows of the matern. In, in this case, they're 20 by 20 degree grid boxes, and this is also a temporal data set, so, so th this is windowed over um, a month of, of time. Um, this, is, this is done at, at a particular depth, and I'm just going to show you results for a, a, a particular depth. And um, I guess a question I had for, for, for Mikael after my talk is um, if you have plans to go um, connect the depths as, as, as well. Um, but um, re remember, here's the, here's the drill to do con conditional s simulation. Um, we have to find the square root of this matrix, um, which is the conditional covariance matrix. The interpretation is that this is representing the distribution of the grid points of the field, the, the field at the grid points, given the observed data. Okay, so Again, if we just put this into the entire spatial domain, um, this is too big to work with di directly. Okay, so the solution here, and it's a, it's a different solution, and at first it seems sort of weird and maybe, maybe simple, but it, it's amazing that it, 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 it works. Um, so what we do is we simply, um, we take this matrix, and instead of evaluating it over the whole spatial domain and over all the grid points, we only ev ev evaluate it over a, um, the, the number of, of, of grid points that, that, that contain a, um, a, a certain number of, of data points. So we, um, we only evaluate part of that matrix, and we do it in a way where it contains um, just, just some of the, the, the nearest neighbors of, of, of the data. So I'll, 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 I'll go ahead and, and just um, lead you through the, the details of this. For each, each grid location, and we can actually have many grid, grid boxes here to evaluate this, um, we create this little local conditional covariance. We find the symmetric square root of that, and um, the symmetric square root, I think, is important. It's important to do this, the symmetric and, and not just the Cholesky. Um, we go into this matrix and we find, I'm calling it the center row, but it's really the row of the matrix that corresponds to this central grid location. And so that's a single row. We can call that row a set of weights, and we apply that set of weights to... Um, 
to a, a set of white noise values uh, on this grid that, um, that, that match that, that set of weight locations. And so these, these weights are not going to include all of these um, white noise de deviates. They're only going to include sort of a, a little neighborhood around the, the grid point that we want. Okay, so we, we apply those weights, we get a field value, and um, here, here's the weird thing, is that um, everything else we just th throw away. We've done this um, decomposition of, of a matrix, and we're only interested in, in that middle row. Um, the reason is that um, we want to do this conditional simulation locally, and while all these other points help in getting sort of a, a, a stable matrix, they're not really particular to the local covariance parameters that we estimated at, the, at that grid point. Okay, so we, we loop over all the grid points following this. And what makes all this work is that whenever we need the, the white noise values on the field to apply the weights to, we're always going back to the same realization. So we're always re reusing the, those same random values. We loop through all the grid points and we get a nice field that is coherent. Um, the, the way you can think about this, this, this mentally is essentially we're computing a discretized kernel um, that, that represents the conditional covariance function. And we're simply running, running that, thank you, we're, we're just sort of running that across, across the white noise field. Okay, this is an embarrassingly parallel computation, and that's a bit of a, a segue into the last part of this talk. Okay, so um, here's, a, here's a preliminary re result. M Mikhail, we're working on this in, in SAMC in, in the fall and trying different things, ma making sure we were thinking through this correctly. And so here, here's one of his initial examples of, of show, showing how it works. So um, I think this is for, uh, February two, 2012, um, and it's for a, a depth of um, three, th 300 meters. Um, here, here's what the, the conditional mean field looks like. Um, so this, this would be the best expected value, um, give, expected value given the data. Here's a draw from, from the conditional distribution. And it's done in, in this way of where we're taking um, local conditional matrices and and up applying it to, to the white noise field. Okay, so let me explain a little bit about, about this works. And um, what, I, what I like about this part of the project is that you can sort of just look at the Matern family and um, get some evidence in sort of a very sort of general sense how this, how, how this goes. Um, so when, when I was leading you through the algorithm, I was re referring to these weights that we apply to the white noise normal zero ones. Now, if we looked at the entire spatial domain, we could compute those weights for all the grid points. And um, really, the point is, is are our local weights um, very similar to that global set of weights? Now, I can't do it for a really big problem, but I can do those global weights for a problem that's large enough where I feel comfortable where we've actually ap approximated things um, in, the, in, in sort of the uh, exact sense. And um, he, here are some results. Um, this scale is in percent root mean squared error, and I, I just want to highlight this point a, as an example. So if we have a, a field that has a range parameter of 35, and this is a spatial domain of 50 by 50, so it's a large correlation range relative to the, um, relative to the spatial domain, smoothness of 1, a, a nugget of, of um, 0.1 in terms of variance, um, what we're seeing is about 2.5% um, error in terms of using the exact weights to do the condition simulation versus the weights only using a neighborhood of 200 observations. So 200 observations is really driving all the matrix calculations, very simple calculation to do very, very fast. Um, and so I would, I would argue that if we had a domain that had 
100,000 points if it respects this kind of scaling, um, there's, there, there's no benefit go, going to a, a larger conditional um, simulation that sort of this local method is doing pretty well. And what's interesting about this is that for very small nugget variances, it's actually this method is even more accurate. Um, the reason this works is something called the, the screening effect. And um, it's, a, it, it, it's sort of a very sort of natural idea when you, when you think about it. Um, you have a spatial field and you're trying to say something about a particular point. The observations that surround it are giving you the most information. It's possible in a highly correlated field that some observations far away are going to be highly correlated. But if you first, um, if you take into account the, the close observations, those far observations no longer provide extra information. Um, so, uh, so that's the, that, that, that's the screening effect. Uh, essentially, close observations screen, screen your prediction and they give you most of the uh, information you need. Um, the reason that conditional simulation works and why we can look at local neighborhoods is because of that screening effect. We're, we're conditioning on the local values and that's all we need to know. Okay, so very, very quickly, uh, I'm going to finish up with um, parallel com computing in R. Um, so I've, um, I've tried to ex explore doing this on the, um, on the NCAR supercomputer, and I think that there's lots of different way ways to do this, e even using MATLAB or, or Julia or Python using other kinds of packages, using maybe more loosely connected clusters. But this will sort of give you, give you the, the, the flavor of this. Um, so th this is just a little bit of, of telling you about the um, Cheyenne supercomputer. Um, it's, it's on the order of the 10th the to sort of 20th largest in the world, certainly in terms of being committed to um, clim climate research. It, it's one of the largest in the world. It has about 150,000 cores. You want to think of each of these cores as being like a laptop. And so the, the question is, is if you're doing calculations and if you had available to you 1,000 laptops or 10,000 laptops and they could all talk to each other and, and they were all running R, what would you do with them? Well, you might say, well, I, I don't know. <laughs> I'd, I'd probably just give them give them to my friends. Um, I I have um I have another idea, and the and and the idea is that um, if you remember in the conditional simulation algorithm, I put in at the bottom. This is an embarrassingly parallel computation. Embarrassingly parallel is is funny jargon that means these are computations that don't have to talk to each other. So what I'm envisioning here is I'm getting onto Cheyenne. I'm, I have a, a supervisor R session that then spawns many working R sessions. And in this case, um, let's say I have a thousand. Um, spawning the R sessions happens very, very quickly. And so now I have this, wor this supervisor session that can send R, R tasks to all the workers. Um, and if this is an embarrassingly parallel co computation, um, all of these workers can, can, can work. And um, in, the, in the first example, I actually did this. Um, I actually broadcast the data because it's small. Um, turns out broadcasting the data to these 1,000 workers doesn't take too long either. So I have all these 1,000 workers working. Um, what, what can I do with them? So th this is a timing example where I'm changing the number of workers and I'm fitting um, local lattice Krieg models, in this case, nine by nine windows, and I'm showing how the, 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 the time to do this d decreases as the number of workers, or in this case, um, it, it's the same as the number of cores. Um, the important thing about this, this linear scaling is that what it means is that when I'm at 1,000 workers, I'm effectively seeing a 1,000 times speed up in the calculation. And I would argue that if you're doing something and it's happening a thousand times quicker, 
it's going to really change sort of how you think about statistics and how you think about data, data analysis. And that's what I would bring back to the, to the macho linear algebra guy that says I can do this big problem. Um, I, I would like to do sort of large problems and do data analysis quickly on them, and I think this is a, a route to do this. Um, the, the particular software be, behind this is, um, is mainly in R, and part of the idea there is that I want to make doing this computation easy, and I, I typically program everything in R, so I want to stay within an R um, programming environment to do it. Okay, so in, in summary, um, I just want to say emulation of climate model experiments for interpretation and um, quantification is a fruitful area for data science. I think local, local covariance fitting can capture variation in complex model output. Um, we, we did this by using um, these uh, spatial autoregressions, which are really Markov random fields. And then finally, I think that there's an emerging role for supercomputers to support data analysis in this sort of very fast batch kind of situation. Okay, so here, here's some software, and, um, and I also want to draw, draw your attention to, um, to some of these papers, and um, also that this, in particular, this, this very nice sort of tech, tech report that, that Mikhail and, and Michael have developed for the Argo data. All right. Thank you very much. So thank you, Doug, for the very interesting speech. Uh, are there any questions? We have a lot of time, so we can see. Yes. Uh, the question that I would like to raise is con in connection with the 30 models, 30 mm -hmm. climate models. Yeah. Your assumptions, they are independent of each other. That's the right. The realizations are independent. That's right. And as a result of this, you have the bearwise likelihood function. That's right. And I just wonder if you can consider... Uh, the several realization that being produced for each model and to try to come up with a weighted model based on all these three ones instead of trying to combine the two individual results for different models. Hmm. You see what you have? You have yeah. a 30 realization right. for each location. Right. And then you have a variability that goes with this one. That's right. This will be model-related variability. So if you can use this as a weighing factor to try to link these models by getting one single model that will give you the predicted value for, let us say, yearly temperature yeah. to reach the 60 yeah. years temperature. Yeah. So yeah. I wonder, nobody have done this or? Well, um, let's see. So, you know, I want to. So, so first of all, this is this is predicting far into the future. Correct. And um, th there is there is really no way to make a specific prediction. That the best we can do is say there there is a distribution um, of of climate in, in in the future, and this is our best understanding of of, of, of the distribution. The variation in those models is, is representing that, that, that distribution. And so another way to say about what I'm doing is I'm not trying to make a specific prediction. I'm just trying to represent that distribution a little bit better by this emulation and spatial statistics. Because so, also, you, you see, you, you, when, you, when you are doing local thing, right. you are doing averaging in the same sort of thing. You That's try right. to weight all these things. That's right. So I just wonder about, you know, why don't we do it at the source where we have these models initially, yeah. Yeah. and then we have a much more managed yeah. problem yeah. than a, a very large one. Yeah. This is just a, just a comment. Yeah. It's nothing, yeah. nothing. You know, you know maybe, maybe a, a better way to answer your question is each of these 30 models are all equally plausible. 
if we were going to weight them, we would weight them equally. So that's with, within the assumption that we think this is a good model, that it's been correctly set up in terms of initial conditions. But I think you will be able to get empirical weight by the 30 values at each location. Yeah. You see, you will have empirical weight. You see, the prior one, is they are equally oh, likely. Yeah. Yeah. But you yeah. will have uh, yeah. ability possibly to, possibly yeah. to, get, to yeah. get this thing. It's yeah. just, uh, just to comment, yeah. it's nothing yeah. really. No, 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 that's a good point. And that, that people have, have, have studied that. Obviously, I am not doing that at all. So, okay. Yeah. yeah ben? Uh, so I've, I've tried and failed to do this uh, conditional simulation locally that you seem to have succeeded at. Yeah. Um, I'm sort of wondering what the key to your success was. Can you, can you comment more about that? And, and, and does that have something to do with the symmetric square root? Is that, is that what makes it work? Yes, yes. So the, so the, the, the symmetric, if, if you think about a Cholesky decomposition, um, that, that, that um, depends on the ordering of the data. And let, let's suppose you were going to simulate the middle grid box, and just due to some strangeness, you ordered it so that that, that middle grid box is at actually the last one in your vector for the Cholesky decomposition. Well, then, then it gets a really strange set of weights when you look at that, 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 that row. So the, the symmetric square root is trying to approximate the um, the the covariant the, the square root of the covariance kernel for the conditional covariance function. So uh, and, and and if you plot them, they, they look like really nice sort of kernel kernel functions. So um, yeah. Yeah. Um, both, both of those. Um, so you, you 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 generate a nice a nice smooth field that um, is is sort of a, I mean correct in, in some sense. We're, we're not quite Mikhail and I are not quite sure exactly what it's a draw from, but it's it we you know our intuition is that it's it's a draw from something very close to that convolution model for non-stationary fields. So, um, so we, we think we're getting it all, approximately, so. Any more, Any more questions? Well, I just would like to comment what source questions. Thanks, Doug, for a nice talk. Uh, so going back a little bit with the foundation of the, of the model, uh, so given that you are uh, obtaining and fitting a model with the theta and the sigma that are very spatially, uh, do these functions need to satisfy some condition other than just being positive for, for the thing to work, or, or anything works and it's, it's extremely flexible in that, in that regard? Um. It is, it, it, it is very flexible. Um, so, uh, so, so part, part of the point of this is that we can, we can formulate any, any kind of H and we will get a valid covariance function. Now, um, but, but, but to go back to your question about are there, are there conditions on, on sigma and theta and as functions, um, my, my in, intuition is that you have to make certain assumptions about smoothness of those to guarantee smoothness of, of the field. That obviously they're going, if, if you're going to pick, pick thetas that vary very discontinuously, that could, um, that, that could uh, affect the, the properties of the, of the smoothness of the field beyond, beyond the actual kernel that you pick. So, um, I really and, and I really don't understand more, more about it than that. Um, 
since we're estimating these as, as local windowed estimates, we are, we are getting fairly smooth estimates of these. So really our prior is that we're expecting these to be smoothly, smoothly varying. So. We have time for another question. I, I just want one, one, one comment about the square root mm -hmm. uh, issue that I think yeah. is being raised. Do you do some ordering into the matrix itself to try to get this to be stable? Because the square root is known really to be not very stable. This is the, the, the square root. This seems to be not very stable. And I just wonder what you do, because I think usually you can remove root, uh, rows in the matrix mm -hmm. to try to catch up mm -hmm. the most of the variability in the same yeah. and to reduce yeah. the uh, movement. Yeah, okay, so, um, yeah. So um, there, there are two kinds of square roots that I typically use. One, one is a Cholesky decomposition, which is very fast, but as you said, it's also sensitive to things like um, uh, in, in instability, and, and as I was trying to describe to Ben quickly, it, um, the, since it's an upper triangular matrix, it, 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 it's affected by how you order, order things. Um, I, instead, the, uh, the symmetric square root, um, since these are small local problems, I'm just using an eigenvector, eigenvalue de decomposition. That, that is much more stable if, if, if the matrix is, is close to being singular. And um, the, the ordering, um, it, I don't think it should be a problem. And, and you know, what I'm very careful about is that when I want the center row, when I want the center grid box, I go to the row that corresponds to that. Um, so it can, the, the ordering is, is really not, not important. So, thank you very much. Okay. And thank you. Now we have something for Doug, of course. And uh, so, wow. something for you here. So, this is from today. This is uh, the, the, the diploma for the present invited lecture. Doug. Oh, wow. Some special food, Mexican okay. Okay, well, from Guanajuato. Okay. <laughs> and uh, last but one, please, <laughs> the coffee mug from Thais, Guanajuato. Wow. wow.